Hello, welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Today on the show is Donald Hoffman. Get your thinking cap on. He is a cognitive psychologist. He's a science author and he's a professor at the University of California, Irvine. His research is around consciousness. So in the interview, we talked about what that is, what is reality, what is this world reality, what is this human personal reality, and it just went off on a lot of tangents on just what that could be, what that is, what they're finding. And to give you a little insight, like there are there are essentially like monoliths. There are there are structures outside of this time space reality that they have found, but it's essentially like like looking at something you've never seen before. So there are a lot of really cool emerging things. Like for instance, like uh, that that this table is not real unless you're looking at it. Like, like this table is not local. Like this, this like glass is not local. Like it's everywhere and it's only there when you look at it. And so stuff like that. So it, what we talk about is just basically what does that mean? What, it, what, it, why, why search to find these answers and, um, and what is essentially the point of it all? I hope you enjoy this thought provoking conversation about reality and consciousness and how that plays into our life. So enjoy the show. Please hit subscribe. Uh, I'd love for you to share your thoughts in the comments. This is definitely the kind of topic that there could be a lot of conversation around. So have at it. Man, when did your fascination with consciousness begin? Because like when I hear you talk, I'm like, I just have to keep listening. Well, it started in various ways. Uh, you know, first, through a church, right? My, my dad was a minister. And so he, he was a, a fundamentalist Christian Bible thumping kind of pastor. Um, uh, so, but he was also, he had a master's degree in chemistry. So he had both some science and, and uh, a Christian version of spirituality. And so there they're talking about, you know, there's more to life than just space and time and physical objects. There's the, the spiritual realm and so forth. But, but, and so that got me, thinking, but then I got a lot of, you know, dogmatism, which made me then second guess the whole thing. You know, it's hard to know as a teenager, do you have to throw the whole thing out? Do you, how do you figure out what's dogmatic nonsense versus what is a, an insight that you really need to keep for yourself? And so I finally decided I needed to, you know, figure it out for myself. And the way I questioned, put the question to myself was, are we just machines? Are we machines or is there something beyond that's special about us. And I decided the, the way to really nail down that question would be to actually understand what could machines do. And that seemed to me like artificial intelligence would be the scientific field. So I wanted to do artificial intelligence to just see, so what can machines really do and is there a principled difference or not? And so I, I ended up going to MIT and I was in the artificial intelligence lab at MIT and also in the brain and cognitive science department. So I was looking at the human neuroscience and human psychology side of things on the one hand, and then the what, what could machines do on the other hand. And what I was really trying to do was to, you know, what AI in part, and some people in AI are, are trying to do is to build machines that mimic human intelligence and human behavior. Now, of course, some AI just wants to do whatever they can to make an intelligent machine. But I was interested in, in machines that that sort of model human visual perception and human cognition more generally. And so that was how I sort of got into this whole consciousness thing. I, you know, as a human being, you know, you you wonder what you are and you get one idea at church plus some dogmatism. So you don't know what's what. And then from science, you get another point of view plus some dogmatism. So again, you don't know what's what. And so I decided I had to figure it out for myself. Wow. That is a lot to unpack with your dad, I'm sure, with <laughs> yourself. Was there an experience you had that sort of, or was there an epiphany that you had at some point in time that made you question the information and the rituals or uh, things that happen in a religious setting? Was there an experience? Well, there, there was one. I, as the, I don't know, maybe a 17 year old or 18 year old, I, I remember talking to the head pastor. I had an intellectual question. And How that, dare you? <laughs> well, and that was the response. <laughs> that was, he, he said to me flat out something, this is almost a quote, said, Don, don't worry about it, just believe. 
And that struck me as just the wrong answer uh, for, for this kind of question. I mean, there may be some things that transcend human conception, that's, that's fine, but this wasn't one of them. And so, I mean, I'd seen the dogmatism and when you're raised in it, you don't know any different, right? If you're a fish, everything, you know, you know water doesn't seem wet. So, so, but that one went over the line. When I was told not to question, that stuck in my mind is okay. Now I do need to question and I do need to find out for myself because I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get straight answers here. Uh, so that was sort of a, but it took me a long time, right? You don't, uh, you don't just walk away. At least in my case, I couldn't just walk away from all. I, I really had to find out there's, there's probably something there that's right. And there's probably something there that's very, very wrong. And I, I decided, you know, I couldn't just be crude and just throw the whole thing away. That, that seemed, I felt there was something there in the, in the religious point of view, but I also felt that there was something really there in the scientific point of view. And the fact that they were contradictory meant that I would probably have to figure out what I liked from both and what I rejected from both. So that means you had to do the work yourself. <laughs> I am on the same page as you. I believe, I, okay. I think there's something to be said for all of the different pockets, blocks, dogmas, uh, all the information out there, whether it's religion or science, um, and I feel like, in my opinion is, I feel like things that are spiritual are just things that's, that science hasn't proven yet. What does religion or spirituality get right then? Religion gets a couple things very, very right. A couple of them that science gets wrong and a couple that science gets right. Spiritual traditions, especially the Eastern mystical ones, but, but also Christian mystical, um, you know, it's like Benedictine monks kind of thing. Um, get right that space and time and the physical what we call the physical world is not the fundamental reality i think they're right about that that there is something beyond space and time and until recently science got that wrong science assumed that space time was fundamental like einstein thought space time was fundamental for example uh and of course i admire einstein but uh, you know as a scientist you have to to uh, admire them but then move forward and now Physics has moved forward. Best physicists are now saying space time is not fundamental. They say space time is doomed. So their science is converging with spirituality and saying that space time is not fundamental. So, so that's something that, that, um, spirituality has gotten correct. I would say another thing that spirituality has gotten correct is that they say that reality, whatever it is beyond space time, they will use the word God and so forth or, or, or Brahman or, or, or whatever it might be. They'll say that that transcends any description we can give. It's beyond any language, so that the language that we use should not be taken as the thing. It's just a pointer. So the, the, the Buddha say the finger pointing to the moon is not the moon. Right? And, and, and so I think that they get that right. And if scientists who say we, we've got a theory of everything and, and they believe that, then they've got it wrong. I think most scientists who say we have a theory of everything, it's with a wink and a nod. They, 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 they know that it's not the final theory of everything. But there are some who, who think that they are looking for the final theory of everything. And, and there, I think they're wrong. And I think they're wrong because of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, where this guy named Kurt Gödel proved around 1930 that uh, basically anything that you can write down precisely um, and it's powerful enough to, for example, be able to do arithmetic with it, then there will, he showed that there will always be things that are true that cannot be stated in that language, that they can't, can't be proven, that, well, I'll put it this way, they can't be proven in your theoretical language. So the notion of truth transcends the notion of proof and therefore the, the notion of scientific theory. And that means that there's an unbounded intelligence, as far as the way I think of it, there's this unbounded set of truths and therefore there's unbounded intelligence beyond any description that we could give in language or scientific theories and so the, the spiritual traditions have said that for a long time without you know, they said our language would never do anything but point to the reality now science has caught up with that I, I think most scientists really understand this so you can see that there is this convergence but then the question is, what is beyond space time? What, what, how should we talk about that intelligence? Even though we know that ultimately our, our descriptions aren't it. Nevertheless, descriptions aren't completely irrelevant. So that's the interesting tension. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea that space time is doomed. 
Yes. I'm uh, maybe we back up and back up and like try and unpack like this reality first. Like okay. I'm curious about this. What is the reality earth, this experience at this point in time? And then I want to understand like, what is our, our human reality? What is this experience from a physical body? So maybe start with this reality that we we're in to try to answer that question i have to say you know what framework that i'm using for and i'll give you an answer from a different framework so if i and i'm not saying these frameworks are correct i'm just saying these are the frameworks that i use to think about this kind of thing so one is the evolutionary framework right so if i just put on a hard-nosed evolutionary uh, biology kind of point of view what most people think that entails is that there is a real physical world there are real physical organisms they evolve and they reproduce and when your body dies, that's it. That's that's the standard view of most of my colleagues. My own work with my my um, collaborators, Chaitan Prakash, um, Manish Singh, Robert Prentner, um, several Brian Marion and Justin Mark, a bunch of us have been working on this. We've realized that when you look at the mathematics of evolutionary theory, it entails that our perceptions are not telling us the truth. The probability that we've been shaped to see reality as it is is zero. And it's a, it's a it's a clean theorem of that of that theory, and that means that even though Darwin, when he came up with the theory, was thinking about a real physical world with real physical objects and animals and so forth, in fact, this is more like a virtual reality. What what evolution gave us from this point of view is not a window on the truth. It gave us a headset, a VR headset, to play the game of life. And you know, if you to play a game in VR, if you had to toggle voltages in a computer to play the game, good luck. You would lose against someone who had a nice little headset that knew showed you how to like drive a steering wheel to, to you know to to drive a car or something like that turn a steering wheel to drive a car so if if from an evolutionary point of view we were shaped with senses that guide adaptive behavior keep us alive long enough to reproduce period they don't show us the truth so evolution also agrees that space time is not fundamental it's just a data structure it's just a headset so, so that's one perspective on things, and it agrees with what the physicists are saying. Physicists now are saying space-time isn't fundamental. By the way, evolution doesn't tell us what is. <laughs> it, 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 right? it only tells us that we're seeing through a VR headset, but evolutionary theory does not have the power to give us a hint about what's beyond the headset. Right. It's really interesting. Right. Now, the physicists, they've got, they have used the mathematics of quantum field theory uh, and general relativity together to discover that space-time is not fundamental. But they have tools that allow them to go beyond space-time, and they're doing it. So in the last 10 years, they, so this is fairly recent, they have discovered structures called the amplitudehedron and you know, cosmological polytope, and, and the deepest structures is something called a decorated permutation. So, the, yeah, these are like, they're just, if you've seen the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, but there's the, the, the scene where there's just the monolith is sitting there and all the monkeys are pounding on it and screaming and you know, they know it's significant, but they don't know what the significance is. Right. And, and, and so that's where we are right now. We have these, these static monoliths beyond space time. There, there's the geometric structures like the amplitudehedron right. and the decorated, per, and they're just sitting there and, and my, my feeling is that it's amazing. We've discovered, the, the, the physicists have discovered these monoliths, but there's no notion of dynamics. They're just geometric objects or these mathematical structures like the decorated permutations. So, so that's as far as the, the physicists have gotten beyond space time. You know, are they on other planets, moons? Are they other, are they truly speaking of structures? Are they, are they uh, frequency structures in space time? This is hard to do, but you have to think entirely outside of space time. So th th think of space time as just your headset. And on the other side of the headset are these structures. Okay. So it's, you, you, you think, well, okay, space time, well, that goes out billions and billions of light years. There's trillions of, yep. That's just, all of that is just your headset. You have to think all the way beyond that. And there are these structures. So kind of <laughs> like what's beyond infinity. Exactly right. Exactly right where the infinity is just in your head. When I was a kid, was I was looking up and going, what's at the end of this, it's infinity, it doesn't, what's out there, and you just answered it. 
hats off to the physicists, many, many who have contributed to this, but the amplitudehedron was um, Nima Arkani Hamed and his collaborators. And uh, Juan Maldacena and Nima have been have worked on the cosmological polytope and, and others. So I'm just mentioning a few. There's many, many brilliant people. Many of them are at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, um, uh, where a lot of this work has been done. And the the you know the amplitudehedron was only published in 2013. That's less than 10 years ago. So so this is fairly new. And and so that's no surprise that not too many people know that there are these structures beyond space time. And and many brilliant people have exactly your question, which is how do you put these structures inside space time? Where are, where are they? And, and, and that's a good question because it really points out that no, they're entirely beyond space time. You have to imagine that all of space time, as big as it might seem, is nothing but a little headset. And on the other side of the headset is in a much more complicated realm. Um, and, but all we know about the realm from physics is there are these structures like the monoliths in 2001 and so and no notion of dynamics now what i'm working on is the third answer to your question about you know what's the reality i'm proposing it's consciousness and my my colleague uh, colleagues manish singh and chaitan prakash and others are working with me on this robert prentner where we're working on a mathematical model of consciousness qua consciousness so it's consciousness not as like an emergent feature of brain activity or an emergent feature of some artificial intelligence circuitry or software. It's on, it's fundamental. Like the spiritual traditions have said, consciousness is a fundamental reality. And it turns out with mathematics, you can make that precise. And what I'm working on right now is saying, okay, a dynamics of consciousness outside of space time is in fact the dynamics that gives rise to the structures that the physicists are finding, like the decorated permutations. And we have a paper that we're about to submit in, in less than two weeks for publication, which we actually show that mapping from dynamics of conscious agents into decorated permutations. So we actually can do a mathematical model that says, again, this is science. And so, of course, we're probably wrong, but, 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 but at least it's precise. Here's a mathematical model of dynamics of consciousness. And this dynamics gives us the decorated permutations, which you guys have found beyond space time. So this might be the dynamics behind your monoliths and it's the dynamics of consciousness. So that's sort of fun. That's super exciting. I mean, exciting. you must be like, I mean, publishing is so, it takes so long and there's so much vetting out and <laughs> you guys like to break each other's theories down. And that's the that's sort of your, it's like a quite an a, aggressive process to get to publishing. So congrats for sure on that. I'll be excited to hear, uh, hear and see what that, um, what comes from that. So it's like an interface then. It's, uh, so this, yeah. there's a there's a human experience that is some kind of virtual reality game and that consciousness is above it. And I'm going to share a story and I hope it doesn't diminish me in any way, although I'm not sure where I'm at anyway, as I <laughs> am by no means a scientist or anything. But um, I, 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 I took a psychedelic mushroom and mm -hmm. I was dropped into this very deep experience where it felt like I went to what I would call baseline reality, which I saw myself as a waveform. I just was yeah. a waveform. And um, yeah. there was a whole experience there where I was cold. And then uh, the information was like, oh, cold is just something that you're experiencing as a human just to experience it. But it's just waveform intersecting. And that's really all it is. And just go ahead, cover up. If you're cold, that's what you're supposed to feel. It's just an experience. It's just here to be felt, just like a mango is just meant to be tasted. It's just it's just some sort of intersection of information. And um, and then what I had to agree to to build like this I, in my this is my experience, build the construct to get back to being human uh -huh. was I had to agree to the mind. And like me agreeing to the mind was me agreeing to the lie that this was real, that this situation is real. And that, mm. that, uh, that then showed me that this is why we forget so much, because if you were to remember everything, you would know that this wasn't real and you'd be out of the game. And so um, I, I'm just I I'm I'm just curious what your thoughts are around that and how that correlates with your research and um, all of your scientific developments. Does that even does that even make sense? It makes complete sense. It turns out that these decorated permutations, it, what when you look at it from our dynamical point of view, which which is a new point of view, 
what those decorated permutations are literally coding for are the frequency, various frequencies of interactions of conscious agents. We, the technical term we use are the communicating classes of the conscious agents, but the, the size of the communicating class is effectively telling you something about its frequency, the yeah. frequency of the, the fastest yeah. frequency it could possibly have. And yeah. so it really is these structures that the physicists have found and that we're now coming to from the point of view of consciousness are really these concise descriptions of all the kinds of frequencies. And in, in, in our model, there's an infinite variety of these frequencies, an, uh, an unlimited variety of these frequencies. And we they're all captured in these things we call Markov polytopes and, and the structure of these Markov polytopes. So th what's interesting about it as well is in our theory of conscious agents, whenever two agents interact, mm -hmm. or even if you just have two agents just sitting there not interacting, mm -hmm. they instantiate a new combined agent. Oh my so, so that's just a part, I didn't plan that, but that's what the math just says. So when we wrote down our mathematical model of conscious agents, it just says, if you have N agents, then there is one agent as well, which is their combination, which mm -hmm. means if I have like an infinite number of agents, just like one, two, three, four, so a countable infinity of agents, uh -huh. then if I look at all the combinations, it's, there are, you know, there's a lot of combinations, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it turns out there's so many, it's a new kind of infinity. Yeah. So the so first is called Aleph zero. The smallest infinity is the integers. But when you look at all the possible combinations of the agents of those, it's a higher infinity. It's called Aleph one. But then if we go and look at their combinations, go to Aleph two. This is called Cantor's hierarchy. And so what we, what we, our theory of consciousness is saying is, yes, all the agents are one agent, but our mathematics We'll never be able to describe that one agent because we to describe it we'd have to do all these combinations and look at them and then and Cantor's hierarchy goes up to infinity. So what's interesting is our theory says there is one deep consciousness, the one, yeah, and no scientific theory at least can can ever go there because of Cantor's hierarchy. We can go to level trillion, you know, so we've got to the trillionth level of Cantor's hierarchy, which would be fabulous, but that we have infinitely far to go. So that, that, that's right. So this gets to what the spiritual traditions are saying is that any theory or anything that we say can only be a pointer. And here the mathematics is saying explicitly this theory of consciousness tells you that there's one consciousness, one ultimate consciousness, but it also tells you that the theory itself can only be a pointer. It can never fully describe by a long shot that one consciousness. And yet it may be the best tool we have. So it's also an infinite game. That, that's right. And we're not separate from it, even though we can't describe that infinite intelligence, that infinite one, we are it. So we can be it. We can right. <laughs> know it by being it, but we can't know it intellectually. We can't know the water that we're swimming in as a fish. We that's just right. can't. We can't touch it. We keep trying to touch it, see it, feel it. We can't know it. We don't even know what to look for, maybe to some degree. Um, but the one thing about that experience, too, that was so interesting was that there was I had not only an awareness to agreeing to the mind, but there was an awareness to the waveform like that wasn't the mind and wasn't this construct. And so what I don't know if I've asked this, maybe what is the consciousness or the one? What is the what is the overlay of consciousness? Well, I think that. <clears throat> The spiritual traditions that, that encourage us to sit in silence and let go of all thoughts mm. are and just be are giving us our best insight into that deep, unlimited intelligence that we really are. So when we when we sit and meditate, but thoughts are going through our head, then we're still trapped in the mind. As you said, yeah. you, you had to agree to take on the mind. So you're still trapped in your mind. And that means that you're shielded off from this infinite intelligence. Yeah. And it's scary to let go of the mind because it, it has its own frequency in some sense. It, it has its own life yeah. that it wants to keep. Oh, I was very scared. I was afraid. I was afraid I was, I was gone. I was like, I was, I'm gone. Yeah, it, it, exactly right. And, and so that same fear comes up in meditation. It takes a long time to learn to completely go into inner silence, not just exterior silence yeah. and, you know, no movement of the body. But no right. movement of the mind, just complete silence. And when you do that, then 
you are that infinite intelligence. And Gödel tells us, Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us that even though you are that infinite intelligence, you can't describe it. <laughs> the, 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 any description will all, only be a pointer. So as a scientist then, and as a human being, what I try to do now is to practice. Of course, I want to think clearly and, and rigorously and, and read the scientific literature and the spiritual literature. So that's, that's a mind kind of thing. It's, it's all concepts and mind and so forth. And then take time where I literally stop and say, now it's time to set that all aside and just be in utter silence and be that infinite you know, intelligence and then go back and forth. So some, you know, what you were experiencing with the mushrooms is something that eventually I think we need to be doing in our everyday life. Yes, I, I agree to the mind now. Now I agree to let go of it altogether yeah. and, and go back and forth. And I bet the best advances in both science and spirituality will come from those who do both. If you're just in the mind, you're trapped in the limited intelligence. If you're just in the infinite intelligence, you can't help others who can't. Right. So there's some, for some reason we need right. both. And so in, in my own science, what I do is I, of course, do my studies and think hard, but then I, when I have a problem that I'm interested in, I'll, I'll just stop and be absolutely quiet and see what comes out of the infinite intelligence. Is there something that you have a striking memory of that you were like, boom, there it is. The map to the decorated permutations from consciousness, for example, it came out of the silence. So it's, it's, and I'm not saying that everything that comes out of it is right the first time, but I'm saying it, it, it but it gives you insight. So this is not some kind of infallibility kind of thing, but it, it yeah. is saying that there is this deeper intelligence and we can tap into it um, as we, if we learn to. But but the decorated permutations are one. And and by the way, when I when I came up with the idea of decorated permutations being mapped from these Markovian, um, I had it under a certain concept. And my colleague Chaitan Prakash then tightened up the concepts. So it was it was it, it took the two of us to put mm. together the final definition of it. So so that's the way it works. There's there's the the, the unbounded intelligence that leads to some insights. And then there's the cleaning it up with the, the work of math, you know, Chaitan is a mathematician, for example. So it goes both ways. It feels like there's sort of these dimensions, maybe. I, I don't even know if dimensions are the right word, but I'm wondering if every level of new awareness can be connected through a thread. Is there a way that they all connect? Or is perhaps like, as you're describing this space where there's nothing, is there, is the next dimension is the next reality is the next growth or evolution or awareness is it an, an ineffable kind of reality where it's not based on words it's based on in the mind it's based on feeling or a, a different mechanism yes so one thing that comes out of this theory of conscious agents again one as i said before it it points to the fact that the fundamental consciousness of ultimately transcends any description. So that's that's the fundamental thing. But given that we're describing, here's what it says is a good description. It, it says that there's an unbounded variety of different kinds of conscious experiences, <laughs> one thing. So if you think about it, if I ask you, you know, think or, or imagine a specific color that you've never seen before, <laughs> right? nothing happens, right? It, 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 or, Imagine a five dimensional, uh, concretely imagine a five dimensional space. Nothing happens. <laughs> but, and, and yet we know that mathematically these things are possible. So, okay. yeah. so there's a, there's a whole range of conscious experiences and conscious imaginations that, that we know are in principle possible and we can't do it concretely. So, and then there's going to be a whole range of, so there'll be conscious agents, I would imagine who don't just see like three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, why not have a, a million dimensions of space? What, what, you know, our particular headset of three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, maybe one of the, um, the, the low quality, the lower on the totem pole kind of thing, mm -hmm. where we're, you know, we only get three dimensions of space, one of time. Why not 50 billion dimensions of space? And, uh -huh. Or why not something that, that transcends the notion of dimension altogether? Maybe it's just topological or, or something even far more general. As much as our imagination can expand to imagine the possibilities, they transcend that. The, the real possibilities transcend that. And so for me, then, it's the mathematics then that helps me 
it really has helped me to open up my imagination to the other possibilities. So that's where you, you have your imagination, you put your ideas into mathematics, and then the mathematics comes back and says, here are some new possibilities you didn't even think of. Like with Einstein, he had the imagination that if I, when he was thinking about gravity, if I was in an elevator, he said, and I'm falling, but I'm standing on a weight scale to measure my weight, I would weigh zero if the, if the elevator was in free fall. That was his big idea. And he said it was like the happiest thought of his life was that insight. And a few years later, with lots of work in mathematics, he came up with the theory of general relativity, which coded for that idea. Well, so now the, so his idea led to the math. But then his math, a year later, a guy named Schwarzschild came back to Einstein and said, your math says that there's something that we now call black holes. Einstein didn't know that. He didn't like it. He had to expand his imagination. Um, and it took him decades because he, he was against black holes, even though his own theory said. So here's how imagination leads to math. And then math will prod your imagination wow. to open up to wider. So there's this cycle. But, but I would say then that um, the varieties of possible conscious experience are endless. And we should really take to heart that we can't even imagine a specific new color. So we shouldn't let the poverty of our imagination <laughs> limit us to the idea that there's this infinite variety and you get a touch of it with mushrooms and other um, psychoactive drugs, you get a touch of the doors of perception opening right. to all the, as all the sexually called, I believe, to all these other possibilities. And, and uh, so, so here science and the drugs and, and, and logic all make the same, I think, point. Do you, are, are psychedelics, do you think a, a tool, a helpful tool? I'm, I'm actually just curious from your perspective, if there's something that plays into helping to get insight, or if you even believe of the, believe in the information that comes through people with these experiences. Well, my attitude is that there's probably like, like everything, there's probably some real good stuff there and there's probably some nonsense, right? But you see that in scientific theories, you see that in spiritual yeah. traditions. So yeah. I would say the same thing is going to be true in the, the yeah. studies with, um, with uh, psychoactive drugs. And yeah. so, so my guess is that, again, we, we should go in with an open mind, but also a hard nose sure. and, and, and do the experiments and, and corroborate them across subjects and then get mathematical models and, and, then this, and not jump to conclusions. Uh, but again, uh, on the other hand, if, if an experience gives you an intuition and an idea, you should just, you know, pursue it and see where it goes mm. um, freely. Mm -hmm. Eventually, as a scientist, I'll want it to be rigorous and mathematical and then sure. come back and, and, you know, like Einstein's equations came back and taught Einstein. Well, you know, you didn't know about black holes, but they are black holes. You didn't believe in them. They're there. Yeah. So, you also didn't well, like quantum entanglement. So, you know. <laughs> yes, exactly right. And, and this, I guess, just this week, the Nobel Committee announced the prize for um, the, the scientists who um, really experimentally confirmed the prediction of quantum theory that what, what we call local realism, that, that, oh. it, that local realism is false. So the idea that, that physical objects have in space and time have definite values of position or momentum or spin when they're not observed and that th those definite values have influences that propagate no faster than the speed of light. So the first one is called realism, that they have definite values. And the second part is, is locality. That means that they influences propagate no faster than the speed of light. Everybody has assumed that local realism is true and it's false. Stop it. it. That just came out. And then they got the Nobel Prize for it. So wow. that, that means that it's yeah. not just come out. It, it's been a prediction of quantum theory for many, many decades. It's been known for many, many decades. It was so stunning that it took decades for us to finally get the experiments and that, that convinced the scientific community that this is true. Clauser did this. I think he got the Nobel Prize. He was one of the first to do this, but it took many, many years after he did. So people would say, well, there's got to be a loophole. They would find a loophole. So let's close that loophole. And after they had like for decades, oh yeah, I'm just said, here's a loophole and close it, close it. And when they finally <laughs> closed all the loopholes, Nobel Committee said, okay, <laughs> we may not like it. Local realism is false. And these guys deserve the Nobel Prize for shutting the door 
on saying no to that. <laughs> what is it saying about like the table, let's say, that it's not really local, that what is its fundamental reality then? It means that it doesn't have a position when it's not observed. It Got doesn't it. have a color so, when it's not observed. Right. It, it, okay. It, if you don't have a position when you're not observed, then you're not there. <laughs> I mean, I am with you. I totally, I mean, wild. I do think about that, right? And it's when I listen to you, it's like when you're in a virtual reality or when you're in a video game and you're looking, you only populate, like it's just populating what you see. You don't see behind you. You don't see on the other side of the planet. You don't see. So exactly. when people talk about crazy things like flat earth and whatever, I'm like, Meh. I'm like, it's highly more likely that we're just in a virtual reality. And the reason why everything looks flat is because we're just in a virtual reality. Like it can't make sense because we don't have enough information right now. We think there's exactly. this ball and this thing and it's existing. And that's more likely to me than anything. And so what is then creating our reality? Um example that you gave is just right. If I'm playing Grand Theft Auto in VR and I look over and I see a red Camaro, well, there's no red Camaro in the computer that's running the game. So I'm just rendering the red Camaro when I look. And then when I look over there and I see a, 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 a green Mustang, well, now I'm rendering a green Mustang and the red Camaro no longer exists. It doesn't have a position. It has no momentum, no spin, nothing. It, it doesn't exist. So that's why local realism is false, because the space, time and objects that we see are all of VR. This so we render everything. them as we need. And so that's why it changes why everything. It changes everything. And this is where it gets personally kind of freaky because that means your own body is just an avatar. And it means that I only have neurons when someone looks. So neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. My hand doesn't exist when it's not perceived. But when it's perceived, then it's perceived as an icon in, in some conscious interface. So, so that means that I'm all for neuroscience, by the way. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and best, right. some of my best friends and colleagues are neuroscientists. We need more money for neuroscience, not less. But the reason we need more money is because we thought neurons are the reality. I look in the brain, I see neurons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. It's far more complicated. Those neurons are merely pointers to a much deeper world beyond space time that's far more complicated than neurons. And so we're going to have to reverse engineer neurons to really understand our brain icon that we see when we look inside of brains. So we need more money for neuroscience because their job is far more difficult than we ever imagined. It's basically going to have to understand this whole network of conscious agents that gets projected into our interface and looks like neurons in that projection. Yeah. So, so you can see it's, it's, it's quite complicated, but, but it gets, it's really freaky when you think about, well, I don't have a body when it's not perceived. So that then gets to the heart of your question, which is, okay, what is doing all the rendering? What is rendering the stuff? And of course, the final answer is, I think it's beyond words, right? It's, it, it's the sign. This is your question too, right? This is, is my question. And yeah. the, the best that we can do right now in, in the work that I'm doing is to say we can model this reality using the language of conscious agents. And we can then model with this network. Of, so it's, it's network information theory. It's a branch of mathematics. Using this a network of conscious agents, we can build a model and we plan to do this about how we create this headset. How does a set of conscious agents create a space and time um, and physical object virtual right. reality headset as a interface to represent its interaction with other conscious agents. Right. So we have to build an, a literal network of conscious agents to, that creates the headset. And then what we're going to do is turn that network and have it look at itself. And when we have it look at itself, I expect that we will, it will look like brains and neurons. We all dissolve. <laughs> well, well we, it, it will give us what we see as brains and neurons because that's our, our headset representation of all yeah. the network of agents that are creating this interface. Yeah. So, so that, that'll be a very interesting self-reflective kind of science where we use network of agents to build our interface. We turn the interface on the network and then it looks like the network then looks like neurons to itself. 
So what is the brain? What's the brain doing? Like, what is this? What is this, uh, you know, um, buttery like substance inside of this hard pokey shell that we call a brain? The brain is doing as much as that Camaro does in, in the virtual reality um, game of Grand Theft Auto, right? I see the Camaro when I look, and when I don't look, the Camaro does nothing because it's not there. So it has a loaded program in and of itself. Is there some kind of a loaded program? Like the Camaro knows it's going to, it has parameters. Like the, you know, this car handles really well. It's really fast where the green car is like kind of slow, but you know, you can fit more people or whatever it is. Like, is there an uploaded program in the brain that is already there that limits us to some degree? That, that's a really important question because that really will help to bring this whole idea out. So in the case of the Camaro, right? Where is the information that knows about the, the gas in the Camaro yeah. and the speed of the Camaro? Yeah. It's not in the Camaro, right? The Camaro yeah. is just a bunch of pixels on the, so right. that's, that's in something it's entirely outside of the Camaro. The Camaro right. actually knows nothing about that. The Camaro is just what I see. The reality I'm interacting with is utterly unlike a Camaro. And that, that reality that's utterly unlike a Camaro has all the information that is behind what I call the Camaro and how it behaves. Same thing with our brain. The brain has no information because the brain doesn't even exist when it's not perceived. There is this realm, I'm calling it the realm of conscious agents, that's utterly beyond space and time and utterly beyond the brain. That has all the information, that has all the dynamics. And we project that complicated dynamics into a, a relatively trivial structure that we call the brain when we look at it. Just like I project a supercomputer into a Camaro when I look and see a Camaro. It's almost like the brain is a recorder because even when you think about like how reality, how like life works, you follow patterns, you know, you grow up a certain way and you attract a certain relationship because mm -hmm. of your interpersonal like patterns, whatever it is, there's very much a lot of patterning going on. And so this sort of follows along. So the brain yes. can pick up on whatever exists in this reality as a pattern over and over and over again. And that can shift. It's a big boat to turn, but you can, you can shift that because it's it's just sort of an ongoing patterner, but there has to be something that started a pattern. Yes. And that's, that gets a, to something even deeper here. And that is that we, if there's this one infinite unbounded intelligence, the, the one consciousness, yeah. in some sense, what you and I are, are just avatar projections of it. Yeah. And so it, in that projection, See, see, consciousness itself is outside of time. Yeah. And we're bounded in time. Yeah. So, and it turns out when that, that turns out to be a mathematical theorem in the framework of our conscious agent stuff, it's easy for me to write down a dynamics of consciousness that has no time in the sense of what we think of growing entropy, like things fall apart as time moves on, the yep. things run down. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Well, you don't have to have things run down in, this realm beyond space time. Conscious agents can have a dynamics in which the entropy is constant. But anytime you take a projection of that dynamics of consciousness, so you're losing information, you're projecting the, the one, this huge unlimited one onto some final like space time headset. It's a theorem, a trivial theorem to prove that you will in the process induce an arrow of time, entropy will increase as mm. merely an artifact of the projection. Nice. So all of our patterns, even our sense of time is not a fundamental insight into reality, right? The patterns that we're talking about, well, I started when I was five, I had these patterns with my parents and then, then this pattern with my relationships and so forth. Well, that's, that's, that's a fine description in our space time language, mm -hmm. but ultimately, there's this deeper point of view in which the very notion of time and sequence is not real. It's an artifact of our limited perspective. And mm -hmm. so ultimately, mm -hmm. the, the healing, I think, from all that patterning comes from stepping out of it altogether by going into silence. So, of course, we, psychotherapy, I've spent time in psychotherapy. That kind of dealing with our, our issues and specific things is very, very important. But ultimately, I found the, the, the really deep healing comes when we learn to let go of our projection altogether, go into ultimate silence and experience who we are 
completely independent of our form. And then really deep healing takes place there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's prophetic things that come through that you could have never imagined in that yes. space because you're not using your mind. That, that, that's right. And, and, and yet it can come back and give you good insights for the mind and give you good strategies for, for ways to cope with life and, and act differently in, in the yeah. future. So, Okay, so how, I mean, I guess a very common question um, is about creating reality and you have the ability to create your, real, your own reality. So how do you do that? I think that there's an infinite variety of ways. So, you know, I'm, I'm a geek, but, but how about someone who's an artist or a musician or a dancer? Um, or who loves to write literature or, or make movies. There are, if you think about it, there's even in our little headset, space time headset, we see this incredible variety of, of outlets for, for creative expression. Right. And my guess is that, um, that's the tip of a giant iceberg mm -hmm. that we can't even imagine. Just like we can't imagine a specific color that you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. We can't imagine. So, so the unbounded, unlimited consciousness that mm -hmm. you and I are. But we can't really see it right now because we're we've that consciousness has chosen to project into a limited headset to explore the this range of its possibilities. Mm -hmm. But outside this limited range, there is an unbounded range of things to explore. So we're we're just kindergartners in a little um, sandbox playing with the toys that we've got. But there is a lot more outside the sandbox. So creativity kind of takes you out of the mind and allows for new things to come through is kind of what you're saying. A a absolutely. And, and I, I would agree. And it comes both from, of course, immersing yourself into something like immersing yourself into the details of dance or choreography or filmmaking. But then it also equally involves stepping into utter pure silence. And mm -hmm. both are, are required for the, the real creative expression. This, it's a dance between the form and the formless, as the spiritual traditions would say. Yeah, there it is coming in again. Yeah. All right, let's take um, okay, let's take uh, going all the way down to what is believed to be the universe as a singularity. Is that is that what everyone agrees essentially, or most people agree, or people around you? Do you agree with that? And if that's the case, then then the Big Bang, like. What happened? Like what? It's just like try and understand that from your perspective and your opinion or your research. And then I'm just curious, like as an additional question is like a singularity. OK, well, there has to be something around a singularity. Right. This is, this is just there's something around. There's always a next thing. So what could have been around a singularity and what happened with the Big Bang? So so you're, you're right. That's the, uh, an important question. So the standard view from the physics of space time is <clears throat> that about 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang occurred. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what happened before that is, um, you know, from the physicist's point of view, um, an open question. There's lots of different <clears throat> attitudes about it. My attitude is going back to what I said earlier about time is an artifact of projection. So we could have a timeless dynamics of consciousness. There is no increasing entropy. Any projection will give you increasing entropy as an artifact. Mm. So that means that the, that the Big Bang itself and the whole 13.8 billion year history of our universe is not a deep insight into reality. It's, it's, it's a, an accident of a projection. It's not an insight, it's an accident of projection. And so we're, we don't have to be stuck in that. And we can actually have this model, we can actually model what's beyond space time like the physicists have found the amplitudehedron and cosmology. So we can go beyond space time with their models. They're hoping to show like, with, especially with the cosmological polytope, something be before the big bang themselves. So the physicists are already looking for something that will, that will, right. will go beyond it. So what I think goes beyond it is this dynamical model of conscious agents. And so that, and that is, as we talked about, um, not just infinitely complicated, but it goes up all of Cantor's hierarchy, the, uh, all the levels of infinity. So when you take that reality, which is not just one level of infinity, it's an infinite number of levels of infinity, and each level is infinitely more large than the level before it. So it's yeah. hard to wrap your mind around. Right, now right. take all of that and try to cram that into three dimensions of space, 
in mm. one dimension of time. It's mm. no surprise you get singularities because there's mm. so much to cram. So that's why we get these singularities at the Big Bang and black holes and so forth. It's mm. we're taking this infinite, complicated, unbounded intelligence of, of consciousness and cramming it into a four dimensional data structure and the data structure can't do it. And that's where we got these singularities. So that's where they come from. It's like I think about Newtonian physics and you think about quantum theory or quantum quantum mechanics and they don't really jive. And it is there just a new math, a new like a completely new arrangement of information with each level of awareness or each dimension? Are dimensions even real? Like what what are does that even come into your work and what you're looking at is dimensions? Right. So first I'll say what the physicists are doing here. So the physicists are, are saying that they can go beyond quantum theory and beyond Einstein's special and general theories of relativity. So, so um, Nimar Khani Hamed, for example, at the Institute for Advanced Study is very explicit about that. And if, for those who are interested and, and want some beef, <laughs> If you just Google Nima Arkani Hamed, A-R-K-A-N-I-H-A-M-E-D, mm -hmm. and Google his name and Harvard Lectures 2019, or Harvard Lecture okay. 1 2019, he gave an entire course, a semester-long course at Harvard, telling the physics graduate students about the new structures beyond space-time. So, okay. so, and he's saying explicitly, quantum theory is not fundamental, space-time is not fundamental, both quantum theory and space-time will arise, he says, joined at the hip from mm. these deeper structures. And in that semester-long class, he then takes the students through and shows these deeper structures, like the especially the amphitrohedron is what he focuses on, the positive Grassmannian and the decorated permutation. So they really focus on that. But the idea is, yes, we can go beyond space-time. And what we want to do then is to show how precisely space-time and quantum theory arise as projections of a far deeper theory. So they mm -hmm. arise as projections of a far deeper theory. And then, you know, Newton arises as a special case, for example, of Einstein. Newton, uh, Newton's theory comes as, um, as the speed of light goes to infinity, or is a special case of quantum theory as so-called Planck's constant goes to zero. Mm. So what we try to do, we don't throw away our old theories, we, we love Newton. Newton's theory is wonderful. Einstein and quantum theory are wonderful. They were incredibly powerful tools and they will remain powerful tools for a lot of applications. And any deeper theory that we come up with, we want to show how when we project it, we get special cases of the old theory. The old theory is a special case of the new theory that we have. So that's what science tries to do. Now, some theories we just throw away. We've had theories, uh, you know, caloric and so forth in, in, in the history of science where th there was nothing to say. It was just so wrong that we're not trying to <laughs> show that it's a special case of our new theory. It was, it, that was just wrong. So that happens in science too. Um, but I think evolution of natural selection will also come out as, again, um, a special case. So we'll have this theory of conscious agents, for example, in which there's no competition. Hmm. There's no limited resources. Hmm. That's a different there's reality. There's no nature red in tooth and claw. But when you take a projection of it onto a space-time interface, then you get the illusion of time, you get the illusion of competition and the illusion of limited resources and competition. So this whole thing is an illusion of projection. So I'm coming back to when you said, I think we'll go between these two states of it's what it sounds like you're saying is there'll be this sort of perception that will uh, like uh, anchor us in a time space reality and competition and all the other things. And then you go out of that and into this uh, more pure awareness state, uh, for lack of a better word, um, that uh, where, where there's a different reality, uh, a bigger reality. And so I I say that, but really my question is, is that what happens when the next theory is like, what happens with the next theory? I mean, just the fact that this, the Nobel Peace Prize was given for nothing being local. I mean, what is the, impl what are the implications of that? And how do we move forward as humans? Well, it was, it was a Nobel physics, Nobel Prize in physics. The good news for scientists is that Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us that there's infinite job security. <laughs> we, we will we can never get a theory of everything and so my theory of conscious agents with my team is absolutely not the final theory of everything it's the next baby step so i so so 
I'm sure I want to see it in my lifetime where my theory gets completely transcended. And there's some deeper theory that shows that my theory is a special case. And this will go on forever. Um, so in principle, because that's what it means for this unbounded intelligence to be the final reality. It means that theory building um, is um, a really good job to go into because you're never going to uh, <laughs> be unemployed. <laughs> so what's the drive then? What is the ultimate goal? That is a great question. The, the honest answer is, I don't know, and I'll just speculate. It, it may be, uh, there are two directions of answers that I've thought about. And, and then I'll say why another problem with both of those directions. So one direction would be to say, um, the ultimate reality is, is love. But to really love, um, you need something to love. And so the one intelligence projects itself into multiple avatars so that it has a chance to learn to love and to practice love. So that's one idea. So the reason for making all this variety of headsets is for the one to learn to love. That's an interesting direction. That, uh, a friend of mine, Perry Passaro, uh, suggested that to me as we were talking about your, your question. Um, and that, and again, I'm not saying, well, I'll say why I think that there's a deeper problem here. But the other is to say, you know, um, this is more from the exploration side of things, is to say, well, Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us there's an infinite variety of mathematical structure to explore. Infinite. It's endless. Mm -hmm. And that means that there's an infinite variety of conscious experiences to explore. Infinite mm -hmm. variety. Yeah. Which is and exciting. so maybe that's what so consciousness is exploring all of its infinite possibilities and saying, well, let me try on this headset. And maybe, you know, three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, which is what we've got, is a yeah. fairly rudimentary. Right. This is like we think of ourselves as sort of the exalted. We, if we could look at the big picture, we might realize, oh, yeah. no, 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 this, this is a particularly simple headset. Oh, try yeah. the 50 billion dimensions headset. Or right. You no think dimensions. that chocolate tastes good? <laughs> Hang on a second. It, it, Hang on a second. Exactly. Exactly. Full right. body orgasm with this chocolate. Here you go. <laughs> it, that, 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 that's right. Or if you thought <laughs> orgasm was something, wait till you see this. <laughs> right. Right. So, so, so those are two different directions. Yeah. One is about love. One is about um, just the, the fun of exploration. But in talking about this with a, a friend of mine, uh, Annika Harris, um, mm. Mm -hmm. who's, uh, you know, she's got a book called Conscious and she's, she's, uh, she thinks very deeply about consciousness. Um, and when I was talking with her just a week or so ago over lunch about this very topic, she said, you know, that that's effectively, she said it's too romantic. So she meant too anthropocentric. Those, both of those kinds of explanations may not, they may be the best kind of ideas that we can have from our point of view of avatars in space and time, but they, and and they're good, for, but but we shouldn't cling to those either. The, I mean, there's probably something even far deeper than that. And I th I think your point is well taken, yeah. but nevertheless, I think it's worthwhile to put out these romantic ideas, these human centric ideas, if, if for nothing else, to have them as foils, so that we can go deeper and find deeper answers to that to your question. Mm -hmm. Well, when we go to the first one about love, I think you also mentioned something about there being a lot of Basically, it seems harmonic and peaceful. So how do you know love if you don't have the opposite? Are polarities fundamental to evolution, even if it means just the next level of awareness? Like, how do you know this without that? Right. That's that's a really good question. What? Why does the unbounded intelligence decide to drop into these smaller realms of polarities? Right. Because in some sense, there is no opposite of love. L love just is. And mm. yet here we have um, what we might call clinging and not clinging, which is mm -hmm. sort of our, mm -hmm. our, our mm -hmm. polarities that we call love um, mm -hmm. in the human sense. Although there is that, you know, Mother Teresa kind of love that isn't the kind of clinging, right? There is that deeper kind of love that, that is possible. But much of what we call love is not. It's, it's the more clinging or, 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 you know, or eventually running away from somebody. Um, so sometimes they do. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> and and I, that is an incredibly deep question, which is, why does the unbounded intelligence 
plunge itself into these avatars. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the kinds of things we've sketched about learning to love and exploring all the possibilities. So, somehow I feel like I'm up against the limits of my current abilities with that question. I just that's that's, okay. that's as far as I've gotten this, and I don't know how to go further. Which except just to, to go into silence and and um, see what comes out of it. That's beautiful. I love the honesty of that. That's that's um that's the right answer. Okay, to kind of like sort of wrap up at least what's going on within our realm right now that seems like something kind of interesting that I'm just curious what your thoughts are and how it will play into all this is just um, AI. You know, I know that that was something of interest to you initially um, going into artificial intelligence to understand things. So um, do you think that that, you know, what what's the best case scenario that what's the worst case? And, you know, right. how could that help us in our evolution? And is AI actually our evolution? Like, is, right. do you believe that consciousness can be, uh, do you think that uh, an artificial intelligence can adopt consciousness and can have one? Right. So the standard way that that question is asked is from a physicalist framework. Most of my colleagues who are thinking about it are saying space and time is fundamental. Matter is fundamental. Matter is not consciousness. Matter is not conscious itself. But the idea is if you have the right kind of complexity in the interactions of matter, so the right kind of neural circuitry or the right kind of artificial intelligence software, somehow the unconscious ingredients will give rise to consciousness. So integrated information theory, for example, is one theory along that line where they think that they, some there's a, if, if a system has some kind of functional property they call integrated information, the right kind of integrated information, then it will give rise to consciousness. Consciousness will okay. be there or orchestrated collapse of microtubule states, or something called a global neuronal workspace. So there's different ways where you have some substrate. You know, integrated information theory, people can say, well, they don't have to assume space time, but they're going to assume some substrate, that, substrate that's not conscious. And if it's not physics, what is it? That they haven't said. But anyway, so they're trying to say that the artificial intelligence consciousness would emerge from unconscious ingredients. And I'm saying that the hmm. physicists are telling us that those ingredients don't even exist when they're not perceived. They can't give rise to consciousness because they don't have the power. Uh, local yeah. realism is false. So the Nobel yeah. Prize was given this week. Local yeah. realism is false. It's time for our theories of consciousness to recognize that local realism is false. Physical objects do not exist when they're not perceived, so they could not create consciousness. So that version of you know, artificial intelligence giving rise to consciousness is dead. It, it can't work. Yeah. Nevertheless, I think that mm. if we we can get at it from a different angle. Okay. Our perceptions of space and time and objects is a user interface to this realm of conscious agents in our current in my current theory. So right now, um, I see through a zoom screen, I see pixels of your face. <laughs> Those pixels are not conscious or unconscious. Yeah. So I also see pixels of, 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 of a wall behind you and mm -hmm. your face has given me insight into your consciousness. I'm, I'm getting an insight into what you think, what you're worried mm -hmm. about, what you're excited about, but the pixels on the wall give me no insight into consciousness. So my interface gives me portals into consciousness. The good portals are things we call human bodies or my cat. The cat body mm -hmm. is a fairly good portal into some consciousness, not as good as human. And yeah. an ant is, is a worse portal a microbe is even worse. And by the time we get down to rocks and so forth, the portal is closed. Mm -hmm. I'm always interacting with consciousness, but my interface has to give up. That's what interfaces do. They're dumbing things down. So if, at some point, they just have to throw up their hands and say, I can't tell you more about the consciousness. Consciousness is far too complicated. I'm just going to show you a rock. There is consciousness. By the way, it's not that the rock is conscious. right? This, I'm not saying the rock is conscious. The rock is just my symbol. So the rock is my perception. Behind that symbol, behind outside of space and time, there, there's consciousness I'm interacting with. And the best I can do is come up with a rock. That's just Got my invitation. Got it. So, so, so that's where we're stuck. So that, that means if we can understand how these portals work, we understand. So we know one way that we can make new portals into consciousness. We do. There's one way we know how to do it. It's very low tech. Okay. It's having kids. Oh, ah, okay. Right. Every time you have a kid, 
You're right. booting up a new interface, a new portal kids? into consciousness, right? Do you have kids? I, I have a, a, a daughter and three grandkids. Oh, wow. So it's, it's, it's sister it's has four or fourth on the way. So I'll have to live through those guys probably. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> so, so suppose that we understand this notion of portal, right? What's going on here that allows me to have access to your consciousness, not complete, but, but genuine access yeah, and yeah. vice versa. Whereas it's less to a cat and less to an ant, right? The, the portal is, if we understand the, our user or our perceptual interface, space and time is an interface that way. And these portals, and I think we can, I think there's no obstruction mathematically. Once we do that, then we should be able to engineer new portals. And it may turn out that when we do that, some of the portals will have, will look like artificial intelligences, but it won't be that unconscious matter somehow gave rise to consciousness. No, it will be that conscious agents learned how their interface worked and reverse engineered mm -hmm. their interface to open up new portals into already existing consciousnesses mm -hmm. that were already there. The technology may look like artificial intelligence and probably look like a lot of other things too, once we really understand this. So my atti attitude is, yes, we will eventually be able to create new portals, not just the old fashioned way through having kids, but we'll be able to do it technologically. And, um, but it will not be unconscious matter creating consciousness. It'll be consciousness opening up new portals into itself. Yeah. Do you think that we'll have uh, extraterrestrial um, portals available to us in our life? I think that you know, there's the, the famous question of, you know, where are they? Where, where are all these extraterrestrials? I mean, we can keep looking for them. We are sure. Where are they? Well, consciousness is all around us. We have a headset on. Right. Look, so we're looking inside. We, we have a headset on. They're all around us. And we're looking like this. And You're I can't like, see I can't, them. Where are they? Are they? And I, that, that's right. I'm looking. I can't where see are they? them. <laughs> they're, they're, all, they're all around us. And so the, the true search for extra. So now I'm not saying that we won't find life at other planets. We, we, we may. And that's, that's perfectly fine. But, but that will still be a trivial, limited amount compared to what's all around us all the time. And this walled off from us by our headset. But once we get these portals, then our, our true search for extraterrestrial life won't just be extraterrestrial, it'll be extra space time, outside of space and time. Oh, <laughs> wow, we have so much to learn. Well, thank you so much, man. There's um, so many big things have been happening, which is very exciting. And yet it's only scratching the surface on the infinite, on the infinite, on the infinite. Exactly right, um, exactly right. But that's what makes life interesting. Absolutely. Humility yeah. is entirely called for. <laughs> oh gosh. Wow. I'm sure that that's a reminder, a reminder in your work much of the time. So Absolutely. Well, th it was today for me. So thank you so much for your time. And my mind is blown. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Almost as good as mushrooms. Huh? <laughs> oh. Thanks everybody for listening to the pretty intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.